So if we talk about the innovation policy and, and particularly the next generation innovation policy for Europe uh, here, as was already also clear from the discussion before the break, this really has to be put in light of, of the, the current growth channel challenge that we have here uh, in Europe. We clearly need growth and the question is where can we look for growth and to which extent can innovation indeed deliver uh, on this growth in this growth agenda here? Can it deliver in which time frame um, and for whom uh, here? And that's of course not so obvious because innovation typically has a lot of political disadvantages. It's typically a longer term uh, agenda uh, here. It's very uncertain and it's also very skewed. It doesn't work for everybody here. Um, so this is why, uh, particularly if we talk about Europe uh, here, we already had, even before the crisis, a problem of turning our innovation into growth uh, here. We all know about the European's innovation uh, deficit here on average, which is particularly also due to the problems of sectoral and company age composition here, with really a fundamental problem of uh, a creative destruction capacity, where we are particularly missing this new highly growth innovative uh, companies here, as already discussed before the break uh, here. Furthermore, this is on average in Europe here is also lots of heterogeneity in Europe with some countries doing very well on innovation dimensions. Denmark is, is uh, one of those countries uh, here. But we also have a lot of lagging uh, innovation uh, countries uh, here uh, where there is any clearly an absence of any innovation growth nexus here, and particularly uh, in countries in, in the south uh, here. And there's very little convergence in, in innovation, even less so than, than in, um, in, in economic uh, welfare in general uh, here. So even, even with all these challenges before the crisis, uh, here we're now facing also, uh, on top of that, the, the challenges from the crisis uh, here, which you might interpret very optimistically as giving an opportunity for creative exit strategies from ailing areas uh, here, freeing resources to move into new areas here. But of course, there is clearly also a risk of, of structural stagnation if we fail to manage this uh, creative destruction um, momentum uh, here. There is clearly also the issue of, of financial and other market failures here, uh, which also put a lot of constraint on, on, fin f on financing, private financing, but also public uh, financing uh, here. Um, on top of that, we have the continuing and, and even accelerating challenges from globalization uh, here, where we can definitely speak of a new multipolar global innovation world uh, here, particularly moving uh, into Asia here, not only in terms of markets, where the markets are for innovative products here, but also where science, technology and innovation capacity increasingly is moving to here. Uh, and then, of course, we're still facing the new uh, grand challenges uh, here, uh, coming from climate change, from aging, from security, um, uh, collusion, um, cohesion uh, here. And all of these challenges are also specific in the sense that they require also a new perspective as, as what we have uh, dealt with before here, because they all are much more intensive in the type of government intervention that they will actually be requiring uh, here. So we, in order to tackle these challenges, we need much more mission-oriented R&D here in order to direct science and technology innovation uh, into these areas uh, here. We still don't know from the past very well how to do these mission-oriented uh, R&D here, how to avoid the, the picking uh, winning uh or picking losers uh, st uh, strategies uh, here. But on top of that, all these new challenges also uh, require much more different types of, uh, of instruments uh, here because it requires a much more focus on how to create the right demand for these type of uh, innovations uh, here, pricing the externality in case of uh, climate change uh, here or for aging also pricing of, of uh, health uh, issues uh, here. So different types of uh, instruments are needed in order to also create demand for uh, those uh, new grand challenges uh, here. So overall, I think our, the, the challenges for innovation policy in the future are really tremendous uh, here within Europe uh, here. For, but important elements that we need to take on board here is first of all that this innovation agenda really has to be put within uh, the growth agenda uh, here. So it's not innovation or R&D per se, it's really uh, how to stimulate growth uh, here. 
It's also very clear that the pre-crisis business as usual policy agenda will not be sufficient here. So even if we would get th that agenda right, it would not be sufficient uh, here. It requires much more focusing on this structural change uh, and creative destruction uh, here. It requires much more focusing and, and how to take advantage of this new geography of, of science and innovation uh, here. Also requires much more focusing on demand, how to create demand for innovation uh, here. Uh, and also in, in light of the, the strict uh, budgetary and, and um, private financing constraints here, also much more evaluating effectiveness and efficiencies of uh, intervention uh, here. So quite a lot of uh, challenges ahead and the question is, can we get it right uh, here? Do we have, um, an opt can we have an optimistic view on Europe's innovation policies for the next uh, decade uh, here? Now, before we start uh, to pick the brains of, of the people here in the panel here, uh, the idea is that we would first um, uh, check a bit your uh, ideas on this uh, here. We have three simple questions uh, here. Can somebody here put them on? <laughs> And you have all a piece of equipment in front of you on which you can vote yes or no. Uh, of course, typically people don't want to say just yes or no and have a lot of other things to say beyond, but that's not possible. So it's either yes or no uh, here. Yes, that one. So the first question, and of course these questions have to be simple too in order to phrase them in a yes, no possible answer here, is do you believe that Europe will be able to bridge the innovation gap with other regions of the world in the next 20 years ahead? Yes, no? So, please vote now, it's just, uh, don't think about it too much, it's just feel, follow your... We will immediately see the, res the results of this as soon as you all push. Sorry? Sorry, people? Yeah, so, so people are still pressing, so the system is waiting till you all made your choice. Don't worry, you will not be held accountable for any choice you make here. <laughs> yeah, can you please finish? Stop. So can you see it now? Yeah, okay. Right, okay, so it's, <laughs> it's a uh, 60% says, no. Oh, that's a bit of a pessimistic view here. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. But perhaps a realistic one, we'll see. Um, so the next question, so, and perhaps it's uh, something we expected a more negative, uh, because now the next question is, what is then the main reason for the innovation gap between the EU and other regions of the world? A, fragmentation of the market, IP rules, lack of coherent European strategy, insufficient public funding, complexity of investment-related legislation, or more generally cultural issues uh, here. So how does A, you can push A, B, C, D, E. You can only choose one. Again, there is no right answer, no wrong answer. Uh, <laughs> and perhaps you want to say all of them, but one more than the other. So which one would be your favorite? Yeah? 
Okay, so we have the results. We're clearly learning. So fragment. So the ah. So the biggest one is is cultural dimensions. Aha. <laughs> okay. So that's 33%. Cultural, that's something very interesting for policy making, how to influence the cultural uh, gap uh, here. Um, lack of coherent European strategy comes in second. Uh, third is fragmentation of the market. And the least is complexity of legislation uh, here. But you see they are pretty uh, close uh, here. Okay. We still have one more to go. And then the next thing is if, particularly if you think that there is this big innovation gap dealt with uh, or mostly associated with cultural differences, uh, lack of a coherent European strategy, at what level should innovation policy ideally be driven? Regional, national or European? Again, of course, I guess you all say you need each of these three levels uh, here, but again, the question is what you think is the the most pivotal level to drive changes uh, here. And particularly changes in terms of innovation policy we will need for the next decade. Where will it come from? At the regional, the national, or the European? Which level will be most apt to take a more drastic new approach and initiate new approach in innovation policy thinking? Yeah, choice has been made. <laughs> okay, so again, it, that indeed reflects that every, obviously we need the three levels uh, here. Um, regional, national, European, but perhaps the national one a bit uh, stuck in, the, in between uh, here. Uh, definitely European, uh, lots of expectations on that level here, but also regional uh, one here. So thanks uh, for participating in this, this already give us, gives us a bit of um, good material to start the discussion uh, here. I would like to turn as quickly as possible to the brains at the table uh, here to see how they think about the challenges of innovation policy in Europe uh, here. Uh, I won't be introducing them into too much detail here because you have all the CVs uh, of the speakers uh, in your leaflet uh, here. So I'll start immediately with uh, Alessandro Cinderella from uh, Ernest & Young who will tell us about some new insights from their own work on innovation in Europe. Thank you. First of all, I would like to, uh, to thank you for the invitation. It's an honor to be here today. Uh, it's a real pleasure. Uh, my, 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 my comment will be based on, uh, on a report that we issued a couple of months ago now, and it's a survey we, we uh, conducted uh, across 680 business leaders uh, in Europe. What is interesting uh, for the debate today is that is the way we selected them. These, these were all CEOs of companies that we put in a segment of the, the way we, we segment the market that is called st strategic growth market. So these are fast growing European companies in different sectors, in different countries, uh, and uh, in dif at different stages of their, of their life cycle. But all these companies are, uh, have been performing very well in the, in the, in the, in the, in the last years. So they are, uh, let's say, exceptional European enterprises as, as we define them. Uh, and we have served them uh, to understand what was their view on the European Union innovation policy. Uh, and just to, to, to put this into, into the, the current debate of, of what should be in the next programming period and what is the perception of entrepreneurs of, uh, uh, around this policy. Uh, so just, just I will just pick up, uh, pick, pick some of the some of the highlights uh, that came out uh, through this through this survey, uh, and throw throw them into the discussion. Maybe some of them would be would be interesting. Uh, overall, 27% um, of the respondents, uh, only 27%, are familiar with uh, with the work of the European Commission uh, to promote innovation. 82% uh, think that the access to the EU funds uh, should be made easier, and 82% believe that the EU policy is too fragmented and needs uh, greater coordination. Uh, just these, these three figures give you an idea of the feeling we get from, from entrepreneurs. Um, we, we are talking, of course, of company. Uh, most of them have benefited of uh, public contributions at the early stage of their life. 
uh, through uh, business angels or uh, regional funds that are available at the beginning when uh, they start up their company. But when they grew up, and most of these companies now are really international and global companies, even if they are not large corporations, but they, they have a size that uh, uh, is already very, very interna international and a market reach that, that goes uh, outside Europe in most of the cases. Uh, they don't uh, consider, for instance, the FP7 or, or other uh, instruments uh, as a potential source for funding uh, their future innovation programs. Uh, because they see these as very complex, uh, very bureaucratic, and, and also the timing of, uh, of, of this kind of initiative is not coherent with, uh, with the timing of the, of the investments that they, they, they do. Um, I think that if we want to point out some of the recommendations that came out for, from this survey and the discussion we had with, the, with these entrepreneurs um, about the role that government and EU institutions should take in, 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 in shaping the future of EU policies, I would like to point out uh, three main areas. Uh, the first area is the area of regulation. Uh, and one, one thing, one ask of these, of these entrepreneurs is about more single markets. Uh, and just two, two areas in which we very clearly came out a pressure to, to improve the speed of the creation of the European single markets is the ICT, e-commerce, all, all that is related to uh, to uh, e-developments uh, uh, and also the venture capital. The fragmentation of the European venture capital uh, is perceived uh, as a, a, very, uh, a very strong element of weakness of, of our economy. Most of them, in, in many cases, uh, um, they, they went to the US market to fund their, 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 their investment when they had to reach out to, to a venture capital to, to fund their growth uh, because it's easier. This is, this is what they said. Um, and then, of course, the research and innovation uh, legal rules in, in many fields are perceived as, as, a, as, as an obstacle. So, I mean, one big ask to governments and, and, and EU institutions is, is on the regulatory side uh, and, and to the creation of the single market. Uh, the second element uh, that is interesting for the discussion we will have in these two days um, is about building, uh, uh, building an enterprise-friendly ecosystem. Uh, and I, here I would like to mention another number. Only 20% of the respondents uh, was aware of the role of the EIT. But uh, the, the interesting point, uh, if, if we consider what they asked for in terms of EU policy, I just would like to mention a couple of things. Legal rules on technology transfer and uh, adequate boost uh, innovative activities starting from European research. Awareness raising initiatives aim at ensuring that industry players are exposed to the results of research to enable the maximum possible absorption between research activities and the commercialization of investors on pan-European scale. So uh, a lot of the, uh, of the requests coming from entrepreneurs are in the, in the direction of what the EIT will, will be doing and is already doing. Um, I think uh, other uh, two interesting elements, uh, most of the respondents, for instance, to our survey, 71% uh, consider private research and development funding as key to innovation. Uh, so, and uh, almost uh, 94, 90, more than 94% of them would favor the strengthening of university industry partnership and technology transfer arrangement. Uh, what, another element that is important is that most of them also consider collaboration with, between large corporations and smaller ones as essential uh, to boost uh, the European innovation strategy. And, and in fact, uh, we, we have seen a lot of cases of very fast-growing companies that grow together with large corporations. Uh, cases in which large corporations acted as incubators of small-medium companies or intermediaries between, uh, between uh, the research world and the, small, uh, and the smallest companies. And also, uh, large corporations can speed up the, the process of inter internationalization of smaller ones. Uh, a third point, uh, and uh, another point, and, and, and the last one I would like to make here um, about the role of EU institutions um, is that uh, there is a clear request of uh, key strategic initiatives in, in, in key strategic industrial sec sectors 
uh, in which Europe can play a role at global level and, and the request of more investments in these domains in, in which uh, in, in, through the creation of platforms uh, that could uh, open new, new markets in new, in new technology areas. Uh, and another uh, point that is important is, is the role that uh, public procurement can, can, uh, can have in the acceleration of the innovation process. So a mix of uh, supply and demand policies. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, Alessandro. I think it's very interesting to have these views, uh, particularly because these are high growth uh, firms uh, here, exactly the target we were talking about before the coffee break here, and to know what views they actually have um, on, on how innovation policy should be here. And stressing the need for, for these more demand-related uh, issues here, I think is important, and also this enterprise-friendly <laughs> ecosystem uh, here with large and small firms uh, here, uh, research institutes, uh, institutes like EIT, uh, as well as policy making, we have also been talking about this before the break here, uh, clearly is, is uh, also raised here uh, as a need for coming from these uh, companies as well uh, here. So um, next is uh, Professor Kelt uh, Lorsen from the Copenhagen Business School uh, here. He will give us uh, some views on how innovation management uh, literature can help to think about innovation policy in the future. Kjeld. Thank you. Uh, I would also like to start by thanking the organizing organizers for having the, uh, invited me to this very exciting event. Um, I'm a, a scholar that's interested in science and uh, innovation as it uh, pertains to corporate strategy um, and not a policy analysis. So I have to say here, I'm, I'm, while I'm at home here at CBS, I'm a, a, a playing a little bit away to, to make a reference to the uh, European COP. Um, but what I will do is I, I will uh, talk a little bit about what I think we know about uh, innovation from uh, a business economics point of view. So my starting point is this one, and I think most people in this room will agree, that innovation is of central importance to European growth and prosperity. So I think that's an easy one. <laughs> now the problem is uh, what do we do about that, because innovation is a very difficult animal. Uh, Reinhilde at the beginning mentioned uh, that we, uh, one of the strongest uh, insights uh, very early on in innovation research had to do with the uncertainty related to innovation. So although you invest a lot of money in it, there's no certain uh, outcome. And I guess also here, policymakers need to be very humble because it's very difficult to, to make accurate and long-term forecasts about these radically uh, changing uh, technologies. So in this uh, context, I would like to propose, um, and to agree, I, I guess this is being followed in some countries, a real options approach to innovation uh, policy. Meaning that uh, countries make small uh, and non-committal uh, investment in new emerging technologies. Uh, without uh, putting all the eggs in one bag, I know there's a lot of people in Europe say, saying that we, we should go for this. I remember when I did my PhD, Everybody said it was ICT, but that turned out to be incredibly di difficult. But the importance is still to make a, a small investment in each area. Then, if it should take off, some competence uh, is available. And I think what we also know is that support for innovation works best at the early stage, when there are a lot of um, externalities uh, possible. Uh, later on, uh, competition may be... May, may be um, and more important. I would also like to, to highlight the, the importance of an excellent science base. Here I think the establishment of the ERC within the European Union has been uh, incredibly helpful. The only problem with that is that it takes time uh, to get this going, but from what I see, uh, from my point of view, this is extremely important. However, I think again we have to be careful, uh, and I think that uh, what we saw this morning, uh, or just after lunch, uh, I think was um, maybe at, um, t at too much emphasis on the importance of uh, university research for, for innovation. By far, uh, most innovation is uh, undertaken at, at private enterprises, that is private, private enterprises. Um, so I l heard a little bit too much linear model, uh, invention within the firm that can then, sorry, within the university that can then be further developed in firms. We know from the literature it doesn't work like that. Um, most often the ideas would, co would come from corporations and would need some support from, 
from, uh, from, from science at a stage. And here I would like to quote my uh, supervisor at the uh, University of Sussex, Keith Pavitt, who once said, uh, dealing with deficiencies in business R&D by making basic science more relevant, quote unquote relevant, is like pushing string. So you can imagine you have a piece of string, and I think it works best if you pull it rather than push it. Uh, so again here, I think, I think a degree of, um, uh, we have to be a, somewhat uh, humble. Obviously, uh, <coughs> collaborative research is a good idea. So this is not a new idea, but I think that all research and innovation studies point to the importance of collaboration. Labor mobility is another issue. Uh, definitely within countries, we know that labor mobility has a positive uh, effect on stimulating innovation. It also works for a lot of other good things. Uh, but perhaps even uh, between countries, it could help us within Europe if we have policies that would stimulate uh, labor mobilities, and that would go both for uh, scientists and, and R&D workers, I guess, in particular. Other issues that um, comes to mind uh, from somebody who studies innovation from a business school perspective would be the role of organization. So when we look at organizations, uh, we see a lot of firms that have a focus on innovation but do not succeed in pursuing this strategy. Now, even if they commit a lot of resources to this, now why is this? Uh, our research shows that this uh, is often due to a lack of an appropriate organizational design. Uh, you need to have certain practices that facilitates uh, this kind of work that is actually different from regular production activity. Uh, in this context, I believe that policies that would stimulate the diffusion of knowledge related to such uh, organizational setup is of use. Right, framework conditions is another issue, and here I would like to highlight the importance of uh, comp competition. So uh, I think in general in life, we have uh, these two things, collaboration and competition, but competition should not be underestimated. Uh, firms are doing this for profit, and profit is a very strong driver of, of um, new products and processes. And I will end off by um, uh, pointing to a small, maybe idiosyncratic uh, point I have, that is the role of social science research. Uh, I serve on the Danish Social Science Research Council, and we make uh, assessments of something called innovation consortia here in Denmark. And way too often, in my opinion, we see uh, proposals uh, excellently developed in engineering, and then there's kind of like one paragraph of social science research, and this social science research is supposed to find out whether there's a market in some 50 years for this product. So in my opinion, this is not social science research. We need uh, ways of funding serious uh, social science research that can, for instance, find out what kind of, of uh, R&D should we, should we support in, in in various, what are the effects? What are the effects of mobility? Questions like this, this is what social scientists can do. Uh, but to guess what goes on in 50 years, I think uh, we would not like to have on our shoulders. Thank you. Thank you, Kjeld. So, and it's very good that you put this uh, linear vision a uh, bit more in perspective uh, here and also open up this black box of uh, industry and companies here and that indeed innovation in companies is not so straightforward and clearly uh, requires much more uh, research on how this actually can be stimulated uh, here. So the next speaker is, is Karen Wilson from the currently at the OECD uh, here and she will bring on board more of the in, um, innovation policy competence at OECD um, for this discussion. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. And I also wanted to thank the organizers, uh, the EIT, for inviting me to participate uh, in the conference and in this panel. Uh, what I wanted to do uh, briefly is to talk a bit about the work that we did at the OECD on the innovation strategy, which came out a couple of years ago, and also some of the work that we've been doing since then in this area. As a number of speakers already said this morning, uh, we need innovation today more than ever. Uh, we need innovation to address social and economic challenges. And as Dr. Schramm said earlier, these are not mutually exclusive. We can address them both at the same time is a very important point. Um, we also need, as we saw from the poll a few minutes ago, we need innovation to, for greater competitiveness, uh, particularly if we see that 60% of the people in the room think that Europe's going to have trouble uh, bridging the innovation gap. Um, 
also, and most immediately, we need innovation for job creation and economic growth. So um, we know that we need more innovation. But one of the things that came out of the OECD innovation strategy was the fact that innovation is much broader than R&D. When we think about innovation, we tend to think about R&D because that's something that we can measure. And so there's a target in Europe, all the countries moving towards 3% R&D spending, and that's supposed to mag magically create innovation. But the reality is uh, innovation is uh, also about processes and methods. Uh, innovation is much broader than just R&D. So what we've been trying to do at the OECD since the innovation strategy is to try to start measuring some of, this, uh, some of these other factors, these intangible assets. And these include things like software and human capital and know-how and collaboration. These things are very difficult to measure, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't measure them. Because actually, investment in intangibles is becoming greater than investment in, in technology and in physical assets. So it's a growing area, and we need to measure it. And so we're really uh, making an attempt. Uh, we have a, a, a big project. We just had an interim report come out uh, at the ministerial meeting in May. The final report will come out next year. So we're doing a lot of work in this area. What we see is that intangible assets tend to be, of course, in higher value added segments of the economy, um, and also they lead to increased productivity, as well as uh, they have a huge positive impact on business outcomes. So these are very, very important assets that we need to measure and track, and we need to better understand intangibles and, and how to encourage uh, more innovative intangible assets. Um, the other thing is, and uh, the chair of EIT mentioned it uh, this morning, uh, innovation by itself isn't going to create jobs and economic growth. It's the entrepreneurs, and I was happy to see uh, Dr. Van Gabin's chart with entrepreneurs at the center of the knowledge triangle, because without the entrepreneurs, we're not going to have the growth. We're not going to make the connection between the great R&D and great innovation that we have here in Europe and job creation and economic growth. Um, as mentioned uh, by a number of speakers earlier, um, we need all types of entrepreneurs. You know, we need, uh, certainly we need the SMEs. SMEs play a big role in the economy in Europe. Um, but for growth and job creation, we need the high growth firms as well. And uh, there hasn't been enough focus until recently on high growth firms. Um, there's more and more work now being done in this area. Um, OECD uh, and others uh, are doing work in this area. It's very important. But what we need to understand is that with high growth firms, uh, there's a whole creative destruction process that needs to take place. Some firms disappear. New firms come in. And uh, this increases the overall productivity and growth, and this is where all the new jobs are going to come from and where the innovation will come from. But of course, in Europe, as we saw again from the poll, um, cultural barriers are huge and uh, in terms of entrepreneurship and innovation, and one of the cultural barriers is the fear of failure. So if we're afraid uh, um, for firms to fail, and if we think failure is bad, we're, never, we're not going to have this creative destruction that we really need. So we're not going to be getting rid of these old firms that are no longer competitive um, and have these new young firms that are competitive and create the jobs and the competitiveness that we need to change that figure from 60% to lower <laughs> that we saw earlier. Um, the other thing, uh, we talked a lot uh, earlier about ecosystems, and I just wanted to emphasize that ecosystems are about people. They're not about infrastructure. It's not about building buildings. Um, it's not about incubators. You know, All of these things can play a role, but it's about people. It's about social capital. It's about networks between people, and it's about the linkages between the organizations and the ecosystem or the knowledge triangle, whichever terminology we want to use. Um, and, and, and we've seen over and over again that it's not just the role that these different players play in the ecosystem, but where we really fall short again and again is the linkages between these different players, the links between academia and business, the links between the small firms and the big firms, the links between 
um, government and the other players in the ecosystem. So um, we need to think about ecosystems in terms of the social capital and not in terms of the infrastructure and think about how to facilitate um, the connection of the social capital and not just at the local level but also to have these ecosystems tap into on a global basis to excellence. Um, now with technology and globalization it's much easier to collaborate with people around the world and in fact uh, some of the data at the OECD shows increasing uh, collaboration and innovation. Uh, we have our scoreboard that came out recently that tracks all this data. If you're interested, I have some copies with me. You can also get it online. Um, anyway, increasingly we're seeing that innovation is global, it's broader than just R&D, and certainly it has a very important role to play in partnership also with uh, entrepreneurship, and they're closely tied. I don't know if I have enough time to quickly talk about the role of government. Is there a role for government to play, and what is that role? Um, you know, certainly we know that the right framework conditions are important. Some of the other speakers have already talked about that. Um, also, removing some of the regulatory and administrative barriers are important. Um, we know also the importance of education and training. Unfortunately, a lot of young people are graduating today with skills that are not suited for the jobs that are out there today and for the future. So there's a lot to work, of work to be done in education. So I'm happy that one of the uh, pillars at the EIT is focused on education. This is very important and, and cross-disciplinary education. Um, the other area, and I'll end with this because I think I'm running out of time, and again, uh, um, uh, Professor uh, Van Gabben uh, brought this up earlier, the role of finance. And uh, there's, there's a lot of public money in Europe which can be very helpful in leveraging private money. But we need to be careful that public money doesn't um, crowd out private money. The role of public money should be to encourage more private money to come in. And you know, we see this uh, often, um, um, particularly in venture capital. There's a lot of public money in venture capital, and then we wonder why is it that the venture capital industry in Europe isn't taking off. Um, so there, there are a lot of things that can be done to facilitate bringing private money in, tax incentive, co-investment funds. So I think that um, there's a lot that we have learned about what's worked and what hasn't worked in Europe and within the OECD. We're actually doing a lot of work right now within the OECD looking at financing. I just uh, um, uh, um, wrote a book for the OECD on angel investment, which is a under uh, um, under uh, researched and under uh, exposed uh, uh, area of uh, seed and early stage investment. But also we still have a lot to learn about venture capital because there's a lot of public money in there and a lot of the public money has not been well spent. We've heard from OECD countries around the world. So we have a questionnaire out to the member countries and we're going to be looking carefully at this area and trying to figure out what's working and what's not working. So with that, I'll wrap up. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Karen. Uh, very nice. So I think also your focus on, on high, um, high growth, innovative uh, companies uh, here and raising the issue that we need to be able to deal with the risk that is associated with that and, and um, uh, we need to recognize that uh, failure is a complement to success uh, here. And that, of course, indeed explains partly also the cultural barriers that we have here in, in Europe to deal with um, these high growth firms uh, here. And also your point on uh, raising um, in terms of uh, innovation policy, financing issues, and how that should not crowd out, but uh, try to leverage private uh, funding here are well taken and we'll definitely be following up in that discussion uh, here. So the next few comes from Professor Jonathan Wareham from uh, Isada Business School, who can bring on board partly his, uh, his uh, scientific discipline, but also uh, as being a key actor in, in, uh, in one of the leading business schools, he can also bring on board his private or his um, experience as a, at the university governing uh, body uh, here. So, Jonathan. Thank you very much, and, and thank you for inviting me here today. Um, I attend a lot of these conversations about innovation, innovation policy, and, and, and just even as recently as on last Monday, I was in Brussels at the DG of Internal Markets discussing patent reform, and I came out of it a little frustrated because everyone says the same thing, and, 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 and myself included, um, and, and you keep hearing the same conversation again and again, and, and so I'm thinking, you know, how can I justify wasting five minutes of your time now? Um, I'll, I'll try and bring some perspectives of, of my background. I'm a, I'm a professor of innovation system, information systems, um, and we look a lot at history. Um, 
I liked Carl Schramm's closing perspective saying, you know, is innovation unambiguously good? I mean, it, what intellectual utility does a term have? It's used so with such promiscuity. I mean, you know, mustard gas is an innovation. Radioactivity is an innovation. You know, they, 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 really, we need to be having a, a more focused conversation about what the actual policy objectives are um, for it to make, be of any value to us. Let me give you some examples. Um, about two days ago, many universities around the world celebrated the 100th birthday of Alan Turing. Alan Turing was a mathematical biologist who was brought to bear by the English government on a problem of uh, the, the German war machine, specifically uh, uh, German U-boats sinking everything that sailed on the North Atlantic. Uh, they had to solve the German Enigma code encryption system, and the Germans could change the encryption code every day. So you had this problem that once you solved it the next day, it was, it was, it was useless. So this is why they worked on the first mechan or some of the first mechanical calculators to bring raw computing power to the problem of, of, of decrypting the codes, okay? There was a very well-defined problem. Out of the work that, that, that people like Turing and Claude Shannon did came, you know, the, the, the origins of computer science, information theory, telecommunications, even genetics, okay? all around solving a specific problem. There was a crisis threatening people's existence. And if, if you look at the, the ENIAC computer at the University of Pennsylvania, that was for calculating you know, ballistic trajectories in, in three-dimensional space with friction and wind and so forth. Then the, 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 salt, the transistor came along because the tubes were faulty, right? But this all came out of military applications. And it's pretty hard in the world of technology to find innovations that aren't related to some type of military research. I don't like to say this. It's not a popular thing to say, but it's empirically, I think, it's, it's justified. Out of, out of there came the von Neumann architecture that, that, that justified the, the basis for the PCs we use today. Um, you can't understand the Silicon Valley in California without understanding the defense industry that is so prominent there. And you can't understand the defense industry without looking towards the Cold War, right? So this, this aluminum ball that the Soviet Union put up in space is largely, you know, we can trace that back to the origins, origins of the Silicon Valley. It presented a crisis, and people went to solve that crisis. Now, out of the focus on that specific problem came secondary industries, tertiary industries, ecosystems, industrial sectors to support it. Now, what's my point? Am I advocating for war? No. Am I advocating for, you know, disaster capitalism? No. But I would say there are certain characteristics or attributes of these scenarios that policymakers might be able to learn from, okay? One is focus. Do one thing, do it very well. Two, to the degree that it's relevant you can, um, generate a certain sense of crisis around the problem. Mobilize resources, right? So when, we, if, when I look at some of the things that the EU is doing at the moment, aging, is aging a crisis? I, you know, for me, it's a nice to have social phenomena, right? I, it's an intellectual abstraction. Um, you know, where is the problem? Is it the lower tax base? Is it higher metal costs? Are, are the quality of life or ethical issues or, or urban planning, mobility? You know, where is the crisis? And hence, my recommendation would say, choose one element of it and focus, right? Do it well. Energy. We, there's a lot of serious work in energy, uh, you know, economics at the moment. They're saying, you know, more fuel efficient technologies in and of themselves will just lead to a greater demand for driving. So, you know, what we need to do is shift the demand curve to the left, right? How do you do that? Well, an oil, an oil crisis works wonderfully, you know. Bring back OPEC. If you want to reduce our carbon footprint, push up the price of oil. It's a sense of crisis. That'll change people's behavior. And then the work that, you know, the big energy companies are doing uh, won't be window dressing about sustainable technologies because their existence will actually be threatened. Now, I don't, you know, I don't know how to do this, but it just goes to say that innovation without thinking of the long-term policy objectives is less useful, right? Now, some more implications. When, when we look at things, you know, uh, property rights uh, reform and so forth, there are a lot of problems. They're about to roll out the new IPR regime and so forth, and when the politicians get their hands on this, we all know it's going to be so diluted, it's going to be problematic. Um, in the EU, we, you know, we've gone, we have directives, we have regulations, we have norms, and if you talk to the big companies, they'll tell you all kinds of war stories about, you know, 
BP Energy, a biofuel in one legal region, when you sail several hundred meters, it is no longer legally a biofuel. That's ridiculous. So perhaps the EU should be more heavy-handed in being more explicit. So when we come up with directives that can be locally tailored and, and politicized and, and forced with protectionism, this dilutes the underlying objective of, 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 of the, the, the directive. Patent reform the same way. There's longer discussion here. So what I, what I would suggest simply, normative implications. Keld mentioned, he, he said something, you know, pushing a string, pushing basic science research is quite difficult to do. Um, there's nothing like a good demand-driven strategy, um, you know, irrespective of the wars or, or whatever it is, um, that can drive innovation. So my recommendations for policy people would be go focused, go demand-driven, create a sense of crisis, don't try and do too much. If you, if you talk to the Gates Foundation, for example, they're very disciplined about what they do and don't do. And I'm sure the Kaufman Foundation is too, right? Yeah, they'll say, yeah, thank you for your application for money. These are all good causes. We want to solve your literacy, but we only do health, right? And, 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 and I think the European Union policy makers could learn from some of that discipline as well. Thank you. Thank you. That was indeed, again, a very useful uh, perspective here, trying to see to what extent we can learn from the past uh, mission-oriented uh, research uh, uh, initiatives uh, here. Um, I'd like to nevertheless point out that uh, perhaps the current challenges are sufficiently different from what we had in the past, and particularly from the defense uh, here, because they're much more complex. They require, rather than having very targeted uh, objectives uh, here, um, the current challenges dealing with like climate change here really require also to transitions to completely new eco-energy systems uh, here, which nevertheless will take a lot of time here and much more difficult to, to, uh, uh, to take with a focused uh, strategy here. But again, that's something we can discuss uh, in, the, in the debate uh, here. So the next speaker is uh, Dr. Wolfgang Burchig. Uh, he represents the European Commission uh, here. Uh, that's not an easy task uh, here today, uh, particularly as we have seen how many of you don't really believe in uh, innovation policy uh, in Europe uh, here. On the other hand, the good news is that uh, many of you still think that the EU level is the most important one here. So very challenging position here for you. Everybody expects a lot from you, but uh, doesn't really believe that you can do it. So <laughs> let's see what uh, perspective. Thank you very much, Mrs. Chairman. Uh, I would also like to thank you very much for the invitation to this panel. Now, I think there is broad agreement that in times of strong competitive pressure from globalization, jobs in Europe have to come from uh, uh, innovation, innovation in products, business, services. Now, where does Europe stand in international comparison? And Alexander von Gabin has already quoted innovation scoreboard today. The facts are that uh, United States and Japan are uh, comforting their lead upon Europe, whereas the BRIC countries are catching up. What are the reasons for this innovation gap, which is measured based on about uh, 25 innovation indicators? I think the three most uh, uh, quoted reasons for this innovation gap is on the one hand underinvestment in research and innovation from private uh, business, the lack of knowledge transfer and interaction between business and research. We are very good in publishing. If you compare these innovation indicators, but are we as good in putting these research results into products, services, business. And the third element is that uh, uh, the framework condition, in particular when it comes to financing of risky uh, undertakings, venture capital is badly developed in Europe, certainly also because of cultural reasons. These are broadly the main reasons that are, are identified as causes for this innovation gap. Now, what shall Europe do in this respect? And I think uh, one of the questions has exactly arisen this question, what is the role of Europe? And I think on this point, uh, the communication or the policy message of the European Union, when it has adopted its innovation union, which has set out the 30 basic elements which we should uh, uh, undertake to improve our situation, makes a clear point. This is not only a job for the European Union. This involves member states, 
This involves regions, this involves local communities, but in particular, it involves you. It involves entrepreneurs and researchers. And I think the point you have made on, on, uh, on uh, whether our bad performance in terms of innovation is culturally, uh, 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 has a cultural sources is a very important issue because you might still have all the policy levels doing the necessary jobs. At the end, you need people who take their opportunities and go ahead. So, <clears throat> When it comes to these uh, possibilities on the European Union level, we need to be aware that we have broadly three possibilities. One is funding activities. But you all know nobody wants to give money to the European Union. We are in the middle of a discussion on the multi-financial framework. Uh, there are a lot of discussions that Europe should not get the funding many might consider necessary. If you just take research, our research framework program uh, which hopefully will be increased from now 50 billion to 80 billion, is just 5% of Europe's research spending. So we need to be aware that funding, yes, is a tool at European level, but we need to be aware that there are many, many funding possibilities at, low, at, at, at national and regional level. So there is the funding issue. And one thing is true that is true is sure, if you look at the Commission proposal for the next multi-financial framework, job and growth is at the heart of all policy domains, in regional policy, even in agricultural policy, but in particular in, in the internal policies, job creation and innovation is at the core of our agenda. So we take this point seriously. That's our possibilities in terms of funding, and I will come back on this one, but then we have, as you have indicated, the possibilities to, go, to legislate, but evidently we can only legislate in areas where the treaty foresee that we have competences. Now, we have done our best in particular in certain areas where over time no movement has taken place. You have called the patent. You have called, we, we, have, we are working on standardization. There are certain elements where through the framing of the condition we can, or framing of the legal framework, we can improve the situation for innovation, particular public procurement, we, where we are changing now the, uh, the rules to permit in, to take innovation into account when publishing public procurement elements. Yes, so Europe can also act as a legislator, but, it, when, it, but when it comes to the conditions, uh, SME has to fulfill to get access to the to the register of enterprises in a member state, this is national business. So we need to be aware there once again that there are many elements to be covered by member states and regions. Now let me come back to the funding and we have uh, proposed a new framework program for research and innovation, Horizon 2020, which we consider constitutes a break with the past in several respects. Firstly, because hopefully we will have much more money available. Secondly, for the first time, we tried to integrate research and innovation in one framework program. And thirdly, and that's an issue that uh, our colleague from Ernst & Young and his study has at several occasions referred to, it's also a question or uh, there is also an issue related to simplification. We want to ensure that the next framework program for research and innovation is easier accessible to uh, participants. Now, <clears throat> In what respect will uh, uh, this framework program deliver towards the innovation gaps we have identified, uh, which once again are access to capital, uh, underinvestment from private industry, and knowledge transfer? Let me just take these three ones. We have considerably developed the possibilities for uh, risk financing in this proposal. The, uh, financial instruments we have invented or we have uh, proposed should also leverage much more private investment as it has been indicated by our colleague from OCD. And we have many instruments in this framework program that should in particular help us to get better links between research and uh, markets and business. Also, I admit that there might be innovation which is not necessarily research-related or research-driven. What are these instruments? 
I think one of the best examples we have at, at our hand is EIT, where we have tried, and we will try, continue under Horizon 2020, to reinforce the relationships between uh, business, research, and education, but we do it also in terms of governance. Many people are complaining about these things, but we have the technological platforms, we have the European Innovation Partnerships, we have a lot of fora that should ensure that the demand side and the supply side meet together to find out which things, which developments we have to pursue. And I think at the heart of our proposal is certainly this uh, uh, attempt to integrate research and innovation. As I, as I indicated, there is a risk in Europe that research does not necessarily consider what can we do with the research results. So for this framework program, we will insist a lot that uh, research funding will also be subject to the capacity of projects to provide new products, new services, and new business processes. Innovation in this framework program is also understood in a very broad sense. It does not only cover technological innovation, also we think that through the fact that we will mainly target our efforts to the solution or to the addressing societal challenges, challenges, in particular this aspect will also play an uh, important role, but certainly innovation will not be limited to uh, products, it's also dedicated to processes, business, and it should also cover social innovation, innovation in a broad sense. This is by and large the, uh, uh, what we can do at European level. So, now, I have to a certain extent replied to the question, what can Europe do? 40% thinks that Europe should uh, be the major player. I told you we can do something, but many others have to play a role in this respect. Uh, will Europe succeed in 20 years' time to, 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 uh, to, to gap the bridge uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a prudent civil servant from the European Commission, I could start my sentence by saying, ça dépend, and certainly it depends from many facts because, as I just indicated, there are many actors which are responsible that this becomes a success, and every and each level has to contribute to the achievement of this success. Merci. Thank you very much. So you did a very good job to defend the EU level here and also identify very clearly that you're also dependent on the other parts of the system here to be effective uh, here. Um, so you call for uh, getting more support from member states to play a more active role at, at the EU is, is well received uh, here. Um, more funding, but then also raising the issue of how to uh, leverage that uh, extra funding more in terms of leveraging private funding as well. Is definitely um, a message that we will take up in the discussion further here. You also raised the issue of the critical role that EIT can play in the EU uh, policy uh, environment here. And that's why we have as our last speaker, Giovanni Colombo, who is a member of the governing board uh, and executive committee of EIT here. And I'm sure he will try to put the EIT uh, in perspective uh, in, of uh, innovation policy in Europe. Giovanni? I will not uh, speak on, thank you very much, I will not speak only of the EIT, of course, but on, also some consideration about uh, a couple of things that are, uh, that are very much important, in my opinion. And to do that, I'm, I'm making directly reference to the, let's say, Horizon 2020 perspective and to the values that have been put on the table by the European Commission and the European Parliament as well, and all the elaboration that has been done. I'm referring to the three criteria that should inspire the, let's say, technological and social and economical development of Europe, namely smart, sustainable, and inclusive. Uh, I think that the discussion about innovation is very and too much polarized on the first concept. Even if someone has mentioned also the importance of the social uh, science, et cetera, et cetera, but in practice, what we are speaking about is just a very important thing, of course, but it's just competitiveness and growth. But it, if it were like that, why, why the European community has spent also the other two terms, uh, sustainability and inclusive? What I think is that, and, and inclusion, what I think is that sustainability and inclusion should change the paradigms of innovation very much more radically than expected. And uh, 
one thing that is missing is this, that these three values are too often mentioned, but in a separate way. They need to be mentioned and pursued all together, and I will do some example in that. We all know the European limits of innovation. They have been repeatedly mentioned in the European scoreboard from five years from now. And also the lack of coordination is another very important point, which is much more affecting the member states and the European Commission and also the directorates in some cases of the European Commission and also the measures that are taken in order to support research and innovation. But I would, li would like to underline the emerging aspects. And one emerging aspect is that what we are failing, perhaps, is to recognize the, the, the dichotomy which is arising between the local and the global dimension. And this dichotomy at the European level is very much important. We have the global dimension that we need to face, of course, competitiveness, etc., technological development, etc., but we, we do have the regional level, which is very much important for the innovation capabilities. And this is peculiar for Europe. And according to this diversity, we have developed our own culture, which is quite particular. We run the risk of having a monodimensional view of the development, while these two levels of these two levels of global and local capability should be considered. Um, in other words, in a sustainable vision, perhaps, the models that we are continuously proposing, they are no more valid. I think that the common strategic framework and also the budget review has done a lot of things in order to overcome the limits of the European innovation capability. But we must, in my opinion, take much more seriously this local global alternative and also the fact that those three values smartness, competitiveness, and smartness, uh, sustainability, and inclusiveness must be considered together. If you think of our cities, for instance, in Europe, they are quite particular. Most of them, most of the small ones, still maintain, a, let's say, a middle age uh, characteristics, urban characteristics. We have in Europe a very strong third sector, a non-for-profit sector, which is nowadays in, in the crisis situation, taking the social well-being at a sufficient level. And this is a very important role to contradict and to contrast the contradiction of the development, which is demonstrating of not being totally stable. So we must enter into this kind of uh, consideration. The regions in Europe are very evidently the juncture between this local and global dimension. At the same time, they are preserving and reshaping com continuously the culture, which is a local culture, a tacit knowledge as well. In addition, the regions are the most important actors to work for the social acceptance of the radical transformations that we are going to, to integrate in our society. This is too often forgotten, and not necessarily it has directly to do with growth, with competitiveness, etc. I'm not denying that growth and competitiveness are important elements, but there is another economy, which is the local one, which should be much more taken into consideration in order to look at the environmental aspects and the sustainability aspects. Just to do very quickly, a few examples, a lot of work and research and innovation has to be done in the, let's say, increasing the resource and the process efficiency, rather than just working at labor productivity level, which is a typical objective of the innovation. Resource and process efficiency means, uh, until a few years ago, meant uh, doing more with less but also this kind of expression has been abandoned. And I do agree to abandon the, this expression because it has something to do with the use of raw material and energy on one end and what you are going to produce on the other end. It has something to do with dematerialization, et cetera. Another important element is the decoupling, the decoupling between, from an economical viewpoint and from a production viewpoint between resources and products. 
there are a lot of new business models that are tied to environmental uh, changes. Uh, for instance, the uh, cap and trade models, uh, the pricing of negative externalities, which is not at all fixed for the time being. It's a lot of new models. And this has nothing to do directly with technology, but with a stratum of research and innovation which is not sufficiently explored. And this stratum has something to do with uh, systems on the, one hand, on, on the one hand, technology, but also with society, with economics, with social behavior, and so on, which has already been mentioned earlier. Um, well, just a few words about the EIT. I think that in few words, what I tried to uh, speak about earlier is that this uh, enlargement of innovation models is not sufficiently elaborated for the time being in Europe, but on the other hand, it should be inborn in the European culture. And in too many cases, we have a sense of dependency of, on the culture of other regions. But Europe is not, is not uh, um, it's not California. Uh, we, we must take into account also this kind of uh, point. And maybe the sustainability concept can help, and in, can help us in giving value to, the, to this different attitude. Uh, to conclude, the EIT, I think that the EIT role is at least potentially, it's not fully uh, uh, achieved this, but at least potentially uh, it's a good model for facing these new opportunities. And also to experiment these new innovation approaches that I just mentioned uh, by title, of course. Just uh, there are two or three elements that are quite a lot encouraging who are working, uh, those who are working in the EIT to continue in, the, in, the, in this uh, direction. One is the financial autonomy. The financial autonomy is, is helping a lot the risk the ability to take risks and to find out new paths towards given and shared objectives. Another one is the, the overall funding mechanism of the EIT is based on business models and on business model key performance indicators that uh, are obeying a priori and a posteriori evaluation in the choice of funding that uh, the EIT is doing. Another element is that the EIT naturally is looking at the local dynamics. The concept of collocation center is not only the fact that we are putting persons together to work, but these persons are in a strict relationship with the local, or should be at least, in a strict relationship with the local capabilities and the local abilities to overcome a number of challenges that are arising in our society. And also the funding tools are quite particular. We don't have to to go into details, but they're quite characteristic of the EIT. And there is a last point that, that the EIT should be mentioned about is the fact that we have the ambition of being a role model that is not only to answer the question what we are doing, what is the impact of the EIT on the, the real economy in Europe, but also how we have been able to achieve those results. And this is a very important concept because Europe is also in search of new models of cooperation, of new models of making consortia to work together towards these new challenges that mostly sustainability and, uh, and, uh, and economy are posing on, on the table. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni. So for indeed making this point that we need to integrate smart with sustainable uh, and inclusive uh, here, looking more also on transition of systems uh, here. Uh, and that brings on board also uh, social sciences research uh, more uh, than before. Also point that uh, Kelt uh, used made before. Uh, before I turn to the panel for asking for what the take takeaway messages that they think uh, the audience should um, should uh, leave the room with. I would like to still take a few more minutes to uh, ask some questions from the floor uh, here. So, what are there any issues you'd like to bring to the discussion here? Yeah. Um, one of the significant 
one of the significant differences between, say, the US economy and the European economy is the level of involvement of the public sector as an employer. And I wondered whether the panel would like to say what they thought the chances were in terms of innovation, in terms of public service delivery, and whether they believe that might potentially be a significant approach in terms of European innovation. Yeah. So the role of the public sector uh, here as an actor in innovation. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. I have two questions uh, They came up, I mean, a part came up, the role of social science is important for innovation. And I really, I, I would like to understand that better for looking, for example, as the innovation like the iPad or iPhone. I mean, should social scientists, would they have told Nokia five years in advance you should go to touch phone? I, I, I don't understand that argument from your side. And the other argument was also said, I mean, it was referred from uh, em emphasizing lots of mil mil military push model for uh, technology drive and um, uh, this is of course a very I would say that is really the linear model of, of research and innovation again I mean looking at the business that have been created in the last 10 years both in the biotech area but in particular in the IT area I mean I would say isn't that a totally different innovation model thanks yep. perhaps one more or question Yep. Yep. I answer no to the first question you posed, and I answer cultural to the second question. And I believe uh, that uh, my answer about culture was a little bit different. I'm not referring to the culture of the people who should become entrepreneurs. I believe one of the problems we have uh, is that we believe we know what innovation is. We believe we can recognize it when it happens, and we believe we can make it happen which is not the case for innovation, because otherwise it would not be. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. So if there are... Yeah, there is one more. Here. Here. So, hello. <laughs> Here. No. <laughs> Here. Right over there. Sorry. Hello. <laughs> Sorry, she doesn't... <laughs> yeah, she found you. <clears throat> we had uh, several presentations on innovation, but have a problem because I can't really uh, discern different trends. Because, uh, you know, it's like, like a salad. You put tomatoes, you put uh, uh, cucumbers, some wheat salad, and you discuss about how they should be there. because. Innovation always it's something that we know it exists, but we don't know how to describe it. And we say there is innovation just after it succeeds. Because the innovation who failed is not an innovation. So we can go, and that's good for a business school to do case studies on innovation. Because you explain why this innovation did succeed. And when we want to work on perspective, we have a problem because we don't know if it will succeed. And the sentence uh, that what my predecessor said about uh, if it's the iPhone with touch or with a screen is a good one, we don't know. So I don't understand really when we say on strategies. And you, you call, you, you were asking four questions at the beginning. And the answer on everything is all together because we have to deal with everything. You need to deal European level, uh, regional and national, everything. And the success of innovation, if we find the right uh, salad and the right dressing to, to have the innovation to burst out. So if we speak of policy strategy and we speak about EIT, I don't, from the discourse I heard, I don't see where EIT was uh, cutting edge. Because it's a little bit of everything. And sometimes it's to come and uh, say, there is innovation, we were successful. 
but we didn't know that we will be successful before. So the model of EIT, I can't feel our small SME will find a solution to his innovation. I can understand that you can form new entrepreneurship and someone says this morning that we need to, uh, this afternoon, sorry, that we, uh, how to bring a, a professor to be an entrepreneur, which is not the right thing for a lot of uh, scholars. You need to have a professor and you need to have an entrepreneur. It's two different uh, things. So, what I'm lacking and I'm asking for, it's a kind of differentiation. What we should do, really, and not do a lot of small things. Yeah, okay. I think the questions uh, from the audience uh, clearly highlighted uh, the fact that we still don't know yet what innovation policy, how it should actually look like. There is no silver bullet in there. The many bits and pieces that all need to fit together uh, here. Um, so the question is, do we, do we need to experiment more also with innovation policy here to better find out uh, what works or what doesn't work or are we already sufficiently progressed that we know what works or, or not uh, here? I think that's a fair, uh, fair question uh, to the to the panel here, but not only to the panel. So before uh, closing this panel, um, I would like to very quickly go again through the panel to ask what, uh, what they see as a major takeaway message that they would like to give to both policy makers, but also policy actors, because the audience here is full of policy actors so here. What short uh, policy um, takeaway message they have for this type of uh, policy audience uh, here. Um, if that's possible, <laughs> given all the uncertainties that we still have on innovation policy. Including answers or...? or you, can also, uh, yeah. you can also have as a takeaway a very good question too. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I just would like to pick up the, the, the question on the, on the role of public sector and innovation. I think it's a very good one, considering that public sector represents in some European countries more than 30% of the GDP. Uh, and also there is a lot of space for improvements and, uh, and trying to apply what Professor Colombo said, trying to do more with less. I think that that's, uh, productivity uh, improvements in public sector driven, driven uh, uh, through innovation could be a major, a major area of focus when we can try also to, to improve the quality of the services that, that we deliver, considering also the, the societal challenges that we will have to face uh, in, uh, in, uh, in our continent. Uh, so I think this is, this is uh, a, a very important area of investment for, for, for the European Union in the future. Thank you. Kelt? Okay, so on the role of social science, uh, I totally agree with the uh, two gentlemen in the audience that uh, social scientists can say nothing about this shift, and this was my, indeed my point. Uh, uh, social scientists should not be asked these questions to see if we go for the smartphone or not. We have, what we can do is to understand the behavior to understand the behavior better related to our innovation and entrepreneurship. This I think we can do, but we cannot predict what will be uh, good in 30 years. Uh, regarding the takeaway, um, then I, I, my takeaway would be this one. Uh, I do not believe in this kind of like all out strategy. We just go for biotech or we go for ICT or maybe some other uh, technology. Simply policymakers do not have the information to make these decisions at this point. So. In as far as we're going to use taxpayers' money, I urge the uh, small, um, small uh, non-committing uh, investment to see if this stuff will take off. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, two points related to two questions that uh, came up. Uh, the first one about the role of uh, public sector and innovation in the public sector. Um, I absolutely agree. We need innovation in the public sector. We need it in all sectors. It's not just for business. We need uh, innovation in academia. We need innovation in the public sector. We need innovation in the nonprofit sector. Um, and especially today, where there's less public money to go around, uh, for efficiency's sake, we need more innovation. We need to do things differently. Um, so, you know, hopefully the financial crisis is creating the incentive to make some changes, but I'm not sure we're always seeing evidence of that um, uh, to the degree that we probably need to in countries all around the world. So um, the second point is about this, uh, the, the salad, uh, the right salad and the right dressing. Um, you know, our OECD member countries, when we launched the innovation strategy, they wanted the answer. 
what is the answer to the innovation strategy? What are you supposed to do? But there is no one answer, and that's the problem. So we really struggled with how do we frame something. So we tried to provide some sort of framework that different countries could use for their different context and, and adjust depending on you know, local environments within. Um, but as Dr. Schramm said earlier, you can't just copy the Silicon Valley and, and have uh, you know, a, a, another Silicon Valley in your country. So um, this is really important. And, and so I think the answer is to, you know, I, I, as Jonathan said earlier, we're all starting to say a lot of the same things. I see this also in entrepreneurship. And uh, that's good because language is important. However, we have to implement, and, and, and that's the key. We really have to start doing some of this stuff. We have to stop waiting to have the right answer. We need to get out there, and we need to experiment. And then we also need data. We need better data measurement and evaluation so we can see how these experiments are going. We don't have to get it right. We can fail. But let's get out there. Let's try some things. And that's what I really like about the EIT model. Um, this series of experiments with uh, the different kicks and let's learn what works and what doesn't work and uh, evaluate and uh, move ahead from there. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. It was exactly the, my final point was going to be the same, so I don't have to repeat it again. <laughs> yep. So, so uh, a common criticism of FP7 was it wasn't really about research, it was about income distribution, right? Because you know every country had to be represented, and and and, and you know it, it became a highly politicized funding process. And I must admit, I share some concern that there's a similar risk for the IT because the more kicks you have, the more you're diluting your efforts, right? Um, it, it, and and so the questions about you know can the public sector be used to to simulate information? Absolutely, that's what my my examples all were. Defense contracting is public sector money. Now philosophically. A lot of us don't like defense contracting for obvious reasons. What other industries could, could we do? Well, what about health, right? So I would argue that if any public entity that funds research, um, if they want to do something well with a sufficient critical mass, so the ecosystem effects, so the, the, the ripple effects, so all the, the secondary th tertiary industries come up, they need to focus. And one of the things that a sense of crisis brings you is the political protection to do this, so you're not spreading a defined economic pie over 20 different areas, but one or two, right? So that, 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 that was my, my argument. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Chairman, you have asked what <clears throat> I should take away. <clears throat> I take away that there, that there is still a, a lot of trust and confidence from your part that European level should play an important role in addressing the issues ahead of us. Thank you very much. We take it seriously and we will do our best. Uh, as regards more specific questions, certainly uh, regarding uh, uh, public sector innovation, I think this is an important role, an important opportunity for the public sector to uh, give incentives for innovation. As I told you, we have just changed the public procurement law or directive at European level, because what is the difficulty? According to these rules, I'm, I, I'm not very familiar with them, but they are very complicated. But the key rule is take the cheapest, uh, take the cheapest offer, and that's maybe not the offer that provides the most in terms of innovation. So I think that is a, an issue that should bring us ahead, and certainly also, under Horizon 2020, we will have financing and possibilities for pre-commercial uh, procurement, which should also give a considerable incentive on innovation. As regards the distributive effect of uh, FP7, uh, I strongly object because this was a program that is based and continues to be based on excellence. And this is, by the way, the reason that many member states complain because they have just not got the money back. They think that they should get back. But this is an excellent framework program and uh, distribution aspects as they play a role in regional policy should not play a role in framework program seven nor in horizon 2020. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, I need that. Uh, we, we should articulate a bit better the innovation models, <clears throat> mostly with reference to the goal that are pointing to. Uh, roughly speaking, there are two very big classes of innovation. One is the one which is looking at the business in a strict sense. 
and we are speaking mostly of this kind of innovation for the time being. But there is a second uh, uh, context of innovation, which is the um, innovation with the grand challenges and with the great challenges which are clearly and mostly tied to the sustainability aspects. This, of course, innovation is always the same thing, but applying to different objectives means to use rather different tools in order to achieve the results. In the second case, for instance, we are speaking of social innovation or something like that, which is rather different with respect to the canonical innovation concept. And I think, I do think that the um, EIT model is something, is at least attempting to do something in that respect, because we have at the same time this global concept which is facing the global competitiveness, the coded knowledge, etc., etc., and the local capabilities, which are helping in composing the global objectives, but at the same time, which are facing the local aspects and challenges. Let me thank uh, all the panel uh, members uh, for this uh, very interesting uh, uh, roundtable on innovation policies. Although we haven't given you the, the answer in terms of what innovation policy should look like uh, in the future, I hope we haven't made you even more pessimistic than you were already before you, you started uh, here. Um, I hope we have given you enough food, of food for thought of how to uh, improve in future here and also what role you can actually play in, 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 in making these, uh, these uh, improvements possible here and particularly seeing the EIT and what you do within the EIT as, as part of this experimenting with new policy instruments uh, here. Uh, so I hope you will be uh, very entrepreneurial in making this uh, whole experiment uh, also very, a very learning experiment uh, for policy making in Europe uh, here. Thank you and um, continue the discussion uh, even after this panel. Thank you.